and that's it now. So we are recording. Um, so I'll take the sedirant now for the meeting of the Education Resources Committee of the 1st of June 2021. Councillor Al Alison, I see that you're here. Um, Councillor Anderson, I'm also aware that you are here. Councillor Callahan. Apologies for Councillor Callahan. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper. I'll come back to Councillor Cooper later. Um, Councillor Cowie is here. Councillor Craig is here. Councillor Donnelly. Nothing from Councillor Donnelly. I have apologies from Councillor Dryborough. Councillor Fagan is here. Councillor Hamilton is here. Councillor Harrow is here, as is Councillor Horsham. I have apologies for from Councillor Hose. Councillor Loudon is here. Councillor McAdams is here. Councillor McAllen is here. Councillor Mars is here. Councillor Miller. I'm here, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Nealon, can I just check that you're here? Yes, I see that you're here. Thank yes, you. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Nugent. Hi, Pauline. Thank you. Councillor Razak. Sorry, I'm muted here. That's fine. I can hear you, Councillor Razak. Thank you. Councillor Ross. Nothing from Councillor Ross. Councillor Scott. Here. Thank you. Councillor Walker. Here. Thank you. Councillor Wark. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Watson. Yeah. Um, in terms of external representation, um, I see that John Mulligan is here. Dr Iskander, are you here? Nothing from Dr Iskander. Gillian Coulter. Nothing from Gillian Coulter. I see that Andy Harvey is here. And Marie Hobson. I think from Anne Marie. I have apologies from Hilary Kirby and I see that Christine Hall is here. Yep, here. Thank you. Is there anyone who is present at the meeting, either in an attendance capacity or a substitute capacity, whose name I haven't called? Mary Donnelly. Councillor Donnelly, thank you. Um, can I just double check Gillian Coulter? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll hand back to you, Chair, for this morning's business. Great, thank you very much, Pauline. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we'll get started then um, with our second item of business, which is the minutes of the previous meeting, which you can find beginning at page five on your pack today. As minutes from the previous meeting of the 16th of March. Does anyone have any comments or questions about the minutes just now? Well, I propose that we accept them. Second that, Chair. Thank you, Peter. OK, moving on then. Thank you, everyone, to monitoring items. But starting off with item three, which is revenue budget monitoring 2020-2021 from April to February, and Louise Harvey is going to present this for us. Good morning, Louise. Good morning, Chair. Uh, thank you. Um, this is the standard revenue report up to period 12 of our financial year, which was the 26th of February, um, and is broadly in line with our previously reported position for the core budget and the resources COVID position. I will also give an update relative to the year-end position, given uh, that we're now into June. So Section 4 outlines the position for the Scottish Attainment Challenge Fund for PEF and SAC programmes, and I can report that the most current position following the year-end is in line with these projections. 6.1 has the main financial implications, with a forecast outturn for the resource to the end of March of a projected overspend of 12.571, sorry, 751 million after the approved transfers to reserves of 6.261 million. The forecast cost of COVID for the resource is 12.443 million, and this is the net effect of expenditure of 12.755 million as outlined in Appendix B. And it covers um, education recovery teachers and support staff, cost of supply teachers, school mobilisation costs from August, and ongoing costs around enhanced cleaning and health and hygiene, including PPE requirements. 
In addition, the resource projecting the impact as a result of loss of income due to the pandemic of 564,000, as well as savings not achieved of 99,000 and an underspend in our budget of 975,000, mostly around breakfast clubs and holiday lunch clubs due to the pandemic and our rates budget. <clears throat> The Council has received funding for specific education costs relating to the pandemic as previously reported and the figures at the moment assume full spend. As at the 26th of February, the total funding received for this year has been confirmed at £9.582 million. These income sources are not netted off against the expenditure in the appendices to allow consistent reporting of the expenditure in relation to the pandemic all costs are collated and reporting to the, reported to the Executive Committee, but all income received is reported in its entirety. The resource score budget has an underspend of 44,000 after the cost of COVID is removed, and this is an improved position from the outturn forecast of a 308,000 overspend. At PV12, the 26th of February, we are reporting an overspend of £6.587 million after the approved transfers to reserves, but as reported, funding has been received to cover these costs. Given where we are in the financial year-end process, the final position for the resource is becoming clearer, and following the impact of the further restriction on schools from January 2021, committee has updated that the financial position for the resource is likely to change in some of the more specific funding areas. It has been more difficult for schools to spend and engage in programmes of activity in the areas of counselling, developing the young workforce, sanitary programmes, as well as the impact of staffing on the 1140 expansion in early years and staffing supporting the new element of funding for additional support for learning. It is likely that increased contributions to reserves will be identified for approval in these areas to meet commitments following the schools reopening from the 19th of April, which was into the new financial year. In addition, the funding for education recovery received in late February, March, um, an underspend within teach and underspend within teachers' salaries will be carried forward to support the learning recovery strategy in schools from April 21. This forms part of the funding for learning recovery outlined in the paper later to committee at agenda item nine. We've got our standard budget environments um, proposed for the education budget, and these reflect movements in the budget from the last report from the 29th of January through to the 26th of February. They cover two main areas, the realignment of budget to reflect how services are delivered and money is spent, and also realignment of budget to reflect activities as part of the devolved scheme of management in schools and our EMA payments. So I can refer committee back to paragraph two. The committee is asked to approve the following recommendations. That the forecast to the 31st of March is of an overspend of £12.751 million after approved transfers to reserves be noted, and that this in the main relates to education's pressures associated with its COVID response. It is noted, however, that this was the end of February position, and committee is asked to note that the year-end update at paragraph 6.7, that due to the January restrictions, further underspends will be likely at the year-end in certain areas and programmes, and that funding received in late February will be carried forward to support the learning recovery strategy. Also, that an overspend of £6.108 million, as at the 26th of February, after approved transfers to reserves be noted, and again, funding is held corporately to support this, and that the proposed budget environments be approved. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Louise. Complicated picture at the moment. Thank you for taking us through that. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Louise on this paper? Can't see anyone. Happy to accept? Good, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Right, thanks again, Louise. Moving on, um, next paper, <coughs> excuse me, which begins page 25, and this is Capital Budget Monitoring, um, sorry, 2020-2021, and it's Lorraine who's going to take us through this this morning. Morning, Lorraine. Morning, Chair. Morning, Committee. Um, this is the similar time frame to the revenue report. It's the fifth report of the year for education resources, and it provides you with an update um, on the spend position to the 26th of February, which is our accounting period 12. And it will also, just again, similar to Louise in the revenue account, give you a bit of an idea of where we think we'll be at the end of the year, just given the fact <coughs> that we're most of the way through the year-end accounting process. Section 3 gives the background and explains the budget position for the year. And the main point to note is the budget for the resource hasn't changed um, since we last reported to committee back in March. And the figure is £24.480 um, as a budget for the year. 
Section 5 details the financial implications and the spend to period 12 and also the outturn for the year. So section 5.1 notes the programme for the year of 24.480 with a spend of 18.934 million achieved to the 26th of February. Section 5.2 notes the outturn position um, at that point um, and we were saying that was an outturn of 22.6 million which was an underspend or would be an underspend of 1.9 million pounds. Section 5.3 explains where the majority of that underspend comes from um, and as we reported to committee previously um, it's mainly around the timing of spend across a number of projects where we require the budget to be carried into 21-22 rather than spending it in 2021. Um, the progress of a number of projects, as we've talked about previously, has been impacted on by the ongoing lockdowns. The main projects themselves are detailed for your information in Section 5.3. Section 5.4 details that those underspends are partially offset by additional spend that we've been able to achieve in relation to some of the early years 1140 hours programme. Again, that's mainly a timing issue. We have the funding available in 21-22, so we can bring that forward if it's um, required in the old year. Finally, Section 5.5 notes that we're working on the final outturn position. Um, and while these figures are still being finalised, the overall position for the resource does look to have increased on that. We had that which we had anticipated back at period 12. We will um, provide a final position for the resource um, later on in the year, and we will be part of the executive committee paper that goes at the end of June. And I think the committee um, for this resource is in August, so we'll give you an update, a final position, in a bit more detail at that committee meeting. So if I can refer committee back to the recommendations in section two of the report and ask that the education resources budget of 24.480 million spend to the end of February of 18.934 million and the outturn for the financial year as at that point of 22.6 million be noted. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Lorraine. Thank you. Any comments or questions on this just now? Okay, happy to accept the recommendations. Agreed. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Right, moving on, our next monitoring item is workforce monitoring, January to March 2021, and Aileen is going to take us through this. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. Um, this is the Standard Education Resources Workforce Monitoring Report for the period January to March 2021. So section 4.1 outlines the attendance statistics for committee. Uh, the resource absence figure for March 2021 was 4.1%, which was a uh, 0.6% higher compared to the previous month uh, and 0.8% lower than the council-wide figure. And compared to last year, it's down 1.7%. That all translates to an annual average for the resource for 2021 of 3.3% compared to a council-wide figure of 4.2%. Uh, the position in relation to COVID absence is the council-wide figure for 2021 is 4.2%. And if you exclude COVID-related absence to that, it would be 3.7%. Sections 4.2 to 4.5, the details are in Appendix 2. So, in summary, the occupational health referrals during the period there was 413. There were 295 accidents or incidents recorded during the period and 252 of them relate to physical incidents. There were no disciplinary hearings, grievances or dignity at work issues raised. And over the period, there were 34 leavers and 26% of them completed exit interviews. Appendix 2A gives a breakdown of the vacant posts during the period. And there were 70, 71 posts that became vacant. And uh, managers indicated that 70 of these will be filled and there's one post being held for savings. So I'm referring committee back to section two and the recommendation that the employment information for January to March 2021 for education resources be noted. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions on this? Oh, happy to accept. Agreed. Oops, sorry, first accidental mute of the morning. Um, OK, thank you, everyone. Moving on then, we're on item number six, which is one of our monitoring items. This is on the resource plan. This is quarter four progress report update. And Des is going to take us through this. Morning, Des. 
Good morning. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Uh, this report provides an update on the Education Resources Plan Quarter 4 Progress Report for the period 1st of April last year through until the 31st of March this year. And of course, we're all mindful of the fact that a school year ends in June, although that's a normal year. A uh, background to this report is that members will know the resource plan reflects both the aspirations of the council plan and the community plan and how this is linked and this, this is shown at Appendix 1. Of course, over the last year, our schools and services have been affected, as well as the health of well-being by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, things in the education world never really stop, and the agility and adaptability have been the name of the game, certainly over the last year. And I think it's also worth noting that some me measure this year naturally have been put on pause by the Scottish Government. So at Appendix 2 and page 45, we provide an update on all of the measures in the Education Resources Plan. And this progress report follows the Council's performance management system, known as IMPROVE, and it uses a colour-coded format to show the status of each measure. The status of each of these measures is shown in the table on paragraph 5.2, and you can see the progress there. Worth noting that the AMBERS are in the main affected by COVID-related scenarios, and obviously the report later contextual one that we have there is to do with the CFE levels, which were put on pause by the Scottish Government. So part three highlights a number of the key achievements over 2020-21, and it is worth noting that, that we are highlighting that as key achievements, because the assumption is what have our schools been doing, you know, because we've been facing the lockdowns. So, Chair, if I can be a little indulgent, I just want to focus on some of the achievements over the last year. So under our raising standards, 68.8% of school leavers achieved five or more awards at level five, and 40.6% achieve five or more awards at level six. Both of these are improvements on the previous years and are higher than the national level. The investment made by the council should never be overlooked and over 5,700 Chromebook devices were purchased and made available to children and young people. And then again, 85 learners have engaged in English for speakers of other languages through our Youth and Family Community Learning Service. Supporting the well-being of everyone is important and the attachment strategy training continues to be rolled out to staff in schools and our council services. And of course, as members may recall, our educational psychology service has developed guidance and support on positive health and well-being since the beginning of the lockdowns for some schools. And obviously that targeted support is important also. We had the winter clothing campaign, which took on to account probably over a thousand nearly newer winter jackets uh, for families that were facing hardship in these particular hard times. I won't steal Stuart's thunder. He's got a paper on positive destinations, so I'll leave him with that good news on that one. Uh, and more or less just in the target to support the summer programme. Again, uh, a key success, uh, as well as our staff supporting young people every single day. And it wouldn't be like me if I didn't mention a couple that were celebrating success. We could write a book on success. But Hamilton Grammar get it this time for the success in the Young Enterprise Scotland Awards. And needless to say, I think our music team, the South Lanarkshire Schools Percussion Ensemble, achieved the Gold Plus Award at the Virtual Scottish Concert Band Festival in December of last year, which was a tremendous achievement given the challenges that they faced. So, Chair, well, it's my pleasure to highlight the, this particular report. It's also worth noting that this is an important report because it is around our transparency and our accountability and the performance and review scrutiny group also review the status of the progress uh, and they did so at a recent meeting i'm pleased to tell you that there were no red measures classified as red but we are never complacent so this morning chair the committee has asked to note the following recommendations that the education resources quarter four report for 2020-21 summarised at para 5.2 and attached to the appendix 2 of this report be noted that the key achievements made by the resource to date, as detailed in paragraph 3, are also noted. Uh, there's no areas for improvement, but they may be noted. And that the additional scrutiny of changes to the RAG status of measures, that's the red and the blue ambers, the blue, green and amber, etc., at quarter 2 and quarter 4, as summarised at paragraph 5.5 and detailed as appendix 3 of this report be noted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Des. Thank you for going through that and for pulling out a few of the highlights. Special congratulations, of course, to the uh, groups of young people who were mentioned in, in that um, for um, Hamilton Grammar and for the Percussion Ensemble as well.
Does anyone have any comments or questions on this paper just now? Nope, can't see anybody. Okay, we're happy to accept the recommendations. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Right, moving on then, next item is an item for decisions, item seven. And this is on youth employability, sorry, youth employability and work-based learning. And Stuart's going to take us through this. Good morning, Stuart. Thank you, Chair. Good morning and, and good morning to, to the committee. The purpose of this report is to provide a, an update on the successful funding bid to enable South Lanarkshire Council to deliver the foundation apprenticeships at level four and five, as well as level six, for the period from August 2021 until June 2023, and to request approval for establishment changes to maintain and to sustain the, the youth empl uh, employability programmes. Section three of the paper provides a, a reminder of the purpose of foundation apprenticeships as high value vocational programmes now offered at SCQF levels four and five, the equivalent of national four and national five, as well as at level six, the, the higher level that we are, uh, we've been delivering for a few years now. And that extends the availability of these programmes to a wider range of young people. And that's reflected in the expansion of provision from 300 to around 700 places. Appendix one sets out the available frameworks and, and you'll note that those cover a wide range of job and career families. Para 3.5 notes the, the additional funding of £1.076 million awarded to us through that bidding process and Para 3.6 it goes on to note that our young people are also able to access places through Glasgow and West Lothian colleges, which widens access to provision and widens access to the range of frameworks available to us. Para 3.7 notes the role of the Foundation Apprenticeship Team in actively facilitating and supporting places, and that happens on an individual basis if need be. Section four of the paper provides an update on the graduate programme. Now, this programme was hit particularly hard this year as the colleges uh, were operating on a strict two metre social distancing uh, policy, which is unlike the, the situation in our schools. And therefore, the availability of places was significantly reduced and just under half of the intended thousand or so places we'd hoped to be able to offer were actually available. However, the intent is very much to get back up to that thousand or so places from August, but clearly that will be dependent on COVID safety. Para 4.3 notes that we are now able to join up some of the vocational activity uh, to provide progression from the graduate programme into level four or level five foundation apprenticeships. And that's another positive step in, in maintaining that continuity of progression. Para 4.5 notes that we need to do some housekeeping, I suppose, in respect of the staffing arrangements. I'm looking to pull together some of the existing temporary posts and some of the legacy posts from corporate finance uh, and the permanent posts that we are asking to be approved in this respect are shown in the table in Para 6.6. .6. Section 5 notes that we're also able to link in now to level 4 or 5 qualifications for our winter leavers. Um, that's sometimes a difficult group to keep engaged. Um, sometimes they, they, they see the, the programme as marking time until they're able to leave school. The intent now is to provide them with something which is a bit more relevant, a bit more meaningful, uh, and, and hopefully will be seen uh, by those young people as a useful offer. Section six of the paper then sets out the proposal to add some fixed term posts for the duration of the funding, and that's really in response to the expansion of the offer. Um, and they're shown in para 6.4 and paras 6.5 and 6.6 refer to the posts that I mentioned uh, just a short moment ago. Section seven notes that the funding will be met through our core budgets and the additional awards as per 7.1, noting that the additional grant funding is numbers dependent. Chair, I'd refer committee to section two of the report and ask for approval of the recommendations as follows, that the proposal to deliver foundation apprenticeship level four, five and six programmes based on the Scottish Government funding for the period from August 2021 until June 2023 be noted, and that approval be given to the post detailed in section six, para six, four, to be added to the education resources establishment on a fixed term basis for 23 months, and that the, the current temporary posts identified in section six past 6.6 .6 be made permanent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Stuart. Any comments or questions on this paper just now? See one person. That, sorry, I can't really see who it is. Councillor Allison. Councillor Allison. Yeah. Um, just looking for a little bit more information, Stuart. Um, the um, work programmes, etc. I take it a lot of them will be out with schools 
or are they all within school? If they are out with school, is this pattern over the whole of the region, i.e. Clydesdale, still able to access as many as you can in the urban areas? Because I'm aware that you cannot get uh, by nine o'clock in the morning by public transport to many parts of the urban area from Clydesdale. So just looking for a little bit more information around how that is working, particularly in the Clydesdale area. Yeah, there's a, a, a range of provision um, in, in terms of the vocational programmes and as you correctly identify, some of those are out with school, some in college placements uh, and some actually in the workplaces. Uh, and clearly the current situation is just providing a wee bit um, to make that a bit more challenging. I think what we're seeing uh, across a piece across all the areas is that there's high levels of uptake and engagement and I think the allowance is made around transport in, in the, the Clydesdale area. What we're not seeing is that we have a, a disproportionate number of young people able to access it in other areas or not able to access it in Clydesdale. So I think that the, the, the issue that you raise is very much taken into account. That said, it's something we're always mindful of and, and if there's any you know alternative activities that we can undertake or any supports that we can put in place, then we're always keen to do that. The, the team themselves, when it comes to more vulnerable young people, will look at individual circumstances um, and try and create bespoke packages uh, specifically to support young people irrespective of, of the circumstances they find themselves in. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, if there's no further questions, I propose we accept the recommendations at two. Second that, Chair. Thank you, Peter. Okay, if everyone happy to accept. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Stuart. Okay, we're moving on to our items for noting. First one, item eight, Education Resource Plan 2021-2022. And Des is going to take us through this. Hi, Des. Thanks once again, Chair. The purpose of this report this morning is to present the Education Resources Plan for 2021-22 to committee this morning. The resource plan, as you know, sets out the objectives and actions taken forward by Education Resources in the coming year. And I suppose what I said earlier, given the impact of the pandemic, we've had to look at what we can realistically expect our schools and services, our nurseries, what they can deliver. Although there's no doubt that our aspirations remain high for children and young people. Our resource plan is a bedrock for education resources and school improvement planning and is strongly linked to the report on the agenda today entitled Supporting Learning, Recovery and Renewal. And it's important that we ourselves have a golden thread in that respect. Our education resource plan is built around our strategy on a page which is based on our four priorities which were influenced by the views of our schools, services, young people, our parents, elected members, and of course our professional associations and trade unions, and we thank you for that. Looking back over the year, no one could have predicted the dramatic turn of events we've all had to face, and certainly the impact even on our personal lives, as well as of those of the 50,000 50, children who go to our school every single day. There's no doubt that we have a dedicated highly committed workforce who do some inspirational and amazing things to support children and young people. And you've heard me saying that before, and equally through the pandemic and over the last year, they deserve high credit for that, and particularly given the changing agenda. So creating inspirational learning environments, transforming the educational experience of all our learners, and building on the strengths of our partnerships with our parents and carers, our professional associations, our trade unions and our communities, and keeping our learners and staff safe is something that we want to continue to deliver during the coming year. Our focus again, therefore, will be on taking forward the drivers of the National Improvement Framework and on ensuring inclusion and equality are at the heart of what we do. But in doing so, we must first of all adapt to the challenge of supporting our schools and services as we move ahead to support learning and recovery. And we do recognise that this has been a very worrying and challenging time for young people themselves and indeed families. So the committee this morning is asked to look at page 77 in section one of the resource plan because that's where we set out our priorities and our steps for recovery. So what will we be doing? We will be continuing to deliver education in a safe environment. We will be supporting well-being of staff and young people. We'll be focusing on, as you would expect, the curriculum, learning and assessment and closing the poverty related attainment gap. And last but not least on that batch, maximising digital inclusion, we have come a long way. 
How we will achieve these aims are set out in section four of the resource plan from page 81 onwards. And obviously the resource plan will be a document that will be made available to members online and obviously in the library area. Of course, being flexible and following Scottish Government and professional health advice to keep staff safe and children safe will continue to be a central focus for all of us in the coming weeks and months ahead, as well as supporting their overall well-being. So, Chair, this morning, the committee is asked to approve the following recommendation. That the resource plan for 2021-22 attached at Appendix 1 be noted. That the resource plan be uploaded onto the Council's website following consideration by this committee. And three, that a quarter two progress report on the resource plan for 2021-22 be provided to a future meeting of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Hey. Thank you very much, Des. Um, and as you said, there's obviously a, a thread which runs through from this report to the uh, the, the next as well. Any comments or questions on item eight just now? Councillor Allison. Me again. <clears throat> um, it's a very positive report that Des gives as always. A couple of items ago, we were um, looking at a our corporate report as well. No red zones. We've achieved all our targets. We've got one of the best uh, assets in terms of our estate in Scotland of high quality teachers. Yet we have a plan here that I feel is still leaving a little bit to be desired because in international terms, Scotland is dropping down league tables. Now, league tables can say everything and nothing, but they do give an overall impression of where our education standards or service is. We have a well laid out plan here, but it's very much the same as what we've had in the past. And if you keep doing the same thing, you can't expect a different result. And if we're really wanting to catch up, we really need to think about how we make better use of our quality staff, of the assets we've put in place to be able to do that. Um, has that ever been thought about, Des, within our, our ed ed education resource about how we do that? Because I, if we don't do nothing, nothing will change. Yeah, good, Councillor Larson. I think I would reply to that in a number of different aspects. Uh, I'll, I'll take the last one first. In terms of where we go, we are never complacent. And, and you hear me saying that term on behalf of the authority and our schools. And, and I would like to highlight and direct you to the, the report as well, where we are taking account of the International Commercial Education Advisors report, which will do follow the OECD reports as well. So we are doing horizon scanning and linking in there and what we need to do for the future. But in saying that, does it look the same old, the same old? The format might look the same old in terms of a resource plan, and I accept that. But given the engagement we have with our schools, we can see the resilience that young people have, we can see the resilience that our staff have. And in terms of the debate and the discussions we've had before about performance league tables, you can create the league tables, but what do they tell you? In my previous report, I was showing that we were above the national standards in terms of achievements of young people. And I think one of the key aspects that you don't see in that public domain is the value added, which our schools provide. And you mentioned part of that this morning in terms of the achievements of young people who go to attendance at college, uh, vocational training, you don't see that in league tables. So our schools are delivering on, on a high profile. And I'm sure maybe Tony wants to come in on this one as he might always do. Thank you. Thanks, Des. Yep, I've got um, Joe, I'll come to you in a second, but I do have Tony McDade's hands up somewhere. I can't see you on the screen, Tony. There you are. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Loudon, and it's probably just to, to say, I think Des has summed that up. Well, the presentation of a, an improvement plan may look the same. Actually, the actions are, are, are particularly um, have evolved over time and, and, and have changed. And the levels of, of demand that have been placed on our schools on a continual basis has been significant. The other thing I would say is that around the, the league tables and that notion of international comparison, we will await what the OECD says at the end of this month. But what I suspect they will say is it's the question about whether we measure what we value or we value what we measure around those league tables. And, and I'll give you, a, for instance, around the, the reporting of foundation apprenticeships, work-based learning qualifications at a higher level, the same equivalences to a higher 
qualification. But if we get stuck in a conversation around five hires, which will always be important, then that will be a fairly narrow-based conversation. So one of the radical changes that we've had in senior phase has been that notion of the extended offer for young pupils around work-based learning, the vocational qualification. That's not been in our radar for the past two or three. That's increased over the past while as well. And I think that that, that match between what the broad general education offer is versus what the senior phase and trying to align those has been something that we've spent a lot of a lot of time on as well. So I would say that this does make the point as a as a local authority, we sit well against the, the local authority comparators. In terms of the international perspective, I believe the OECD will also say that, that that measurement, that PISA measurement, is one point in time and one fixed measurement. They will also, I suspect, um, say that there are wider ways of measuring the, the activity internationally as well. Thank you very much, Tony. A conversation I'm sure we're going to be coming back to in the coming months as well. Thank you. Um, I've got Councillor Fagan next, Joe. Uh, thank you, Chair. No, <clears throat> mine was just a, um, uh, just a kind of factual question. I know there's a lot of strategies and plans, as there always is, and in, in these reports that we'll be looking to develop over the next year. I'm just wondering if you've got an idea around the sort of time scale or sort of lightly content of the literacy and numeracy strategies. That, that was my only question. Yeah, I, I can really come back in there, or one of my colleagues, but certainly for the thanks, Councillor Fagan. Yeah, I mean, the literacy and strategy are already in place. Uh, what that is really building on the COVID-19, the pandemic and going forward. So we've got well embedded literacy and numeracy strategies in place. We're beginning to see the outcomes from that in young people as well. And it's just re-emphasising how we need to do that in the COVID world, given the disruption that there's been over the last year or so. Thank you, Des. Um, okay, Joe. I've got um, Councillor Walker next, please. Margaret. Thanks, Chair. Um, it was just, it's kind of related to Joe's question about numeracy and literacy. In terms of the targets, for pupils from deprived areas uh, gaining five awards, those targets are fairly low um, and the baselines are fairly low. Um, is there any way of getting some information about what, what the reason for that is and what some of the issues are? And is it something we should be looking at perhaps in the tackling poverty group? Because um, obviously gaining um, you know, educational awards, employment um, is to some extent one of the routes out a poverty. It's just I'm wondering why that baseline and target is so low. Thank you. Yeah, good question, Councillor Walker. Uh, and I smile with that because these are traditional ones that have come historically uh, from Scottish Government and uh, they've been there for a while. I think that you make a good point in the sense of these are the indicators at a moment in time and it is very important to be drilled down to look at to closing that poverty related gap. So you will see that and we will provide information to you throughout the year on that basis. Okay, and it might be something maybe we can look at in a tackling poverty group as well if we have some more context around it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Margaret. And I think we, we do have an education update, um, a report from education coming up at one of the next tackling poverty groups anyway, don't we? Thank you. Um, Councillor Cooper next, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think we can become over-focused on the the league tables um, at, at, and the the targets and indicators that are set, uh, for example, with the Scottish Government. And I think Margaret Walker made a good point there. Um, you know, we have to drill down a bit, as Des said, and look at what are the needs of our young people that are uh, living in poverty and, and you know, how can we help them to achieve better? And that information doesn't always get publicised because of the focus on, on league tables. Uh, I, I think um, I, I've had years of being concerned about how we report the achievements of young people with learning difficulties. We've never actually mastered that. Um, you know, it's not all about attainment. Sometimes it's about achievement. Um, the other point regarding what Alec was saying is that with the external um, reviews of what's happening in education authorities, uh, I don't think that our targets would be allowed to 
remain the same year after year. There's a, there's a high level of scrutiny now um, internally that we have to report back to the external uh, auditors of, of education. Um, so the targets have to be a moving feast um, and we have to demonstrate that they're linked to uh, individual schools and individual areas. Um, it's just a, just a few points. It's not really a question, Chair. Uh, thanks for the indulgence, but I do feel we have to slightly shift our ideas on looking at league tables. Um, we need to think more about the employability programmes and the opportunities for young people to um, go outside the education system. And it's often young people with learning difficulties that don't fit. And, and, I, and I'm saying that in a broad sense, um, in as much as it could be behavioural difficulties, uh, not necessarily physical uh, difficulties, but behavioural difficulties. It doesn't allow them to fight, fit the nice box of a school, but they can achieve uh, maybe not necessarily five qualifications that will get them in the, the league tables, but they can achieve in regard to employability options that are out there for them. And it's widening that uh, opportunity that's really important and how we find ways of reporting on that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for your comments, Margaret. And yes, I, I agree broadly on, um, on the, the importance of um, measuring and, and considering other uh, achievements as well, which is a, a theme of quite a few of our, our papers today. So I share your views on league tables, I've got to say. Um, thank you very much. I've got Councillor Donnelly next, please. Councillor Donnelly, I think you're on mute. You, I think you're on mute. Um, is that it now? Can you hear me? Yep, that's yep. you. Thanks. Um, it was on point 18, engaging schools and services with children and young people um, on the, where is it? Uh, 17, it's... Okay, so Dodi, I think you've maybe frozen. Sorry about that. Um, the use of plastics in schools, uh, have we got a programme going forward with that? You know, the plastic bottles uh, to reduce that and encourage wells with water within the schools? I'm bringing myself off mute there. Okay, sorry for that. Um, Tony, do you want to come in there? So I've got a few hands coming up in a flurry there. Yeah, uh, thank you, Councillor Lyman. Thank you. Yes, well, we've spent a, a long time. I see that Councillor Craig has put his hand up as well because he probably has a bit of background to that as well. We've done that over the last couple of years. We work really closely with the facilities team, put an extra infrastructure in place as well for children and young people that they can use the reusable bottles and, and that so that they're not always using that, that throwaway activity, probably in a wider point as well. Young people are very tuned in to, to the notion around sustainability um, and their, their environment and we're, we're doing a, a you'll see within the plan we're looking with work around COP26 working with Glasgow and indeed across the West Partnership as well so that's we work very closely for reassurance with the facilities team on this. Thank you Tony. Peter you want to come in there? Uh, thanks Chair. Yeah uh, 300,000 uh, single-use plastic water bottles uh, were sold in the schools before uh, we introduced the the wells, the, the chilled water wells, and I, I, those numbers are staggering. Uh, so I haven't got a, the latest figure is how, <clears throat> how many bottles of bottled water we sell now, but it'll be very much reduced. So uh, something as simple as that not only has helped uh, with the, the cost of the school day, uh, because a, a water bottle was a pound, uh, so now it can be free also reduces the, the single-use plastic. So that, that's, that's been incredibly useful. The, but the, the real reason I wanted to uh, to come in uh, was on the report itself, <coughs> and uh, Margaret Cooper, I think, made some very good points. Uh, I can remember uh, in my younger days uh, being an employer and employing people on the YOP scheme, uh, which was the employability scheme back in the late 70s. Uh, and the difference between 
what's on offer from the report and what you read in the report uh, and uh, what was being done back then uh, is, a, is an enormous step forward. Offering that the, the skills development uh, throughout the, the you know the school curriculum uh, to because not everybody wants to go to university, not everybody wants a, a clerical job, uh, and some people are very happy to be brickies and joiners and, and electricians and uh, love their jobs. So I, I have to uh, I have to say that the, the report itself and what our schools are doing. Uh, it is great and it's very positive and it's also uh, Scotland leading uh, in the positive destinations side so there's a bit of negativity crept in there uh, but uh, I, I just see this as a really positive thing and as we go forward uh, we've got um, uh, the pandemic and the aftermath of that pandemic to deal with and preparing uh, our children for what's coming next is going to be so important. So, yes, it's 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 great. Uh, we shouldn't lose that uh, in the the melee of of, of you know, school reports. But uh, it's it's a good report, uh, and I commend it. Thanks, Joe. Thanks very much, Peter. That's quite the start. Three hundred thousand bottles, plus single use bottles. Sounds like the start of a maths problem as well. <laughs> Laid end to end. <laughs> Answers in the postcard, please. Thank you. Um, we've got Councillor Rizak, and um, that's us just now. Thank you, Mo. Okay, thank you. I'm just go going along with um, what Peter has said. In July 2022, the deposit return scheme is going to be starting up, where all containers um, will be required to be returned to to a point. So, have the schools. Um, made any plans for this? Are you just going to put reverse vending machines or anything in? Or how are you just going to be tackling this? With the number of children you have got in the secondary schools, for instance, um, have you talked about, have you dealt with the viability of having, a, say, for instance, a reverse vending machine to manual return? So that would, that would, be, the, that would be the first one. Okay, thank you. Mo, Tony, did you want to come in there? Yeah, uh, thanks, Councillor Rizak, thank again. For, for reassurance, we had a pilot around reverse vending in a couple of the secondary schools about a year or so ago. We work closely just, just to remember that this will, well, of course, it involves young people, but it involves our colleagues and community and enterprise and work really closely together around the facilities team. But I'll, I'll put that back on the radar as part of our sustainability plan and, and we'll follow that up. Chair, could I get back? Sure. Uh, this pilot, uh, Tony, did, was it manual returns? Um, I know you had one in High Blanter Primary. Is it manual or was it with a reverse vending machine? Uh, Councillor Zach, if I'm saying it correctly, um, I'm going to ask Lynn who's going to, because in terms of the detail of that, I'm now starting to struggle about what that detail would be, so I'm going to ask Lynn if you don't mind. Thanks, Tony. Lynn, either. Yes, I'm there. Morning, everyone. Yeah, just morning. Say, it was a reverse vending machine. I don't know the details, but it, but it was the actual machine and it was located in St Andrews at St Bride High School. Right. Chair, could I get back? Mm-hmm. I was going to say that um, through the fact that I'm in business and everything else, I'm also, I also have dealt with um deposit return scheme for the Federation. And I was going to say that there are some companies that are more than happy to to trial vending machines free of charge um, in, in schools so that they can get, take learnings from that. And if you are interested, I can pass their details on. Yeah, yeah okay. I would be interested in that. That would be useful. I have one secondary school at the moment has been asking questions and has been kind of trying to seek out some information. So that would be really useful if you have it. Great. Thanks, Mo. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, there's a legacy hand you've got up there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Councillor Walker, please. Margaret. Thank you, Chair. Just to, um, to clarify something um, in relation to what Peter was saying, um, could I say I think the numbers going into you know positive destinations um, is very very encouraging. Uh, but my, my point in relation to the targets around deprived areas, um, it shouldn't it should be equity across the areas. We shouldn't be saying you know some eighty percent to get five awards in you know SME more affluent SMID areas. It should be across the board um, in terms of equity. 
because uh, I wouldn't like to be a young person um, living in one of those deprived areas and saying, well, why is it only a target of, you know, 45% of my area, but if I lived in Burnside, it's a 95% target. My, my argument one um, was one of equity and access for people, uh, young people, which I'm sure we, we would all agree with. Not that um, it wasn't as worthy, you know, going into different types of positive uh, destinations. It absolutely is, um, but it, could, it should be equity across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Tony, were you wanting to come back in there? No. Yes, just just quickly, if you don't mind. Okay, Chris, yes. One sec. I actually agree entirely with that. The aspiration, to be really clear, is ex those targets are exactly the same. The aspiration for all of our children and young people that they attain as best they can. What the this, if we remember the context of this. This is a plan about progress as well. The the real the realization is that that, that poverty related attainment gap again, as Councillor Walker rightly said, is complicated. And of course, it's rightly sits around the issues of poverty as well. So the notion that, that we would sit and, and meet that target within one year is not realistic. So we have to set a target around progress. That doesn't mean that our ambition is not around 100% for children and young people from backgrounds of, of deprivation achieving five at level six. That's exactly what our ambition should be. You're quite right. That should never be any less than that. But for the purposes of this plan and report. This is just about trying to measure that progress, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Oops, sorry. Didn't see you speaking there, Margaret. Thank you, Tony. Absolutely. So th this is um, something which has been a national priority, closing the attainment gap for several years now, and then it's, it's clearly filtering down through our own plan as well. So this is simply about the setting of SMART targets that are, are providing something to measure progress against at the moment, rather than a, an end point, rather than a, a final destination. Thank you. Right, there's no more comments or questions. Right, just under the bar there, Lindsay. Okay, on you go. Final comment on this, please. Hi, thanks, Chair. Um, I was just wondering um, about the um, access to the access to councillor rollout, and wondering what if there was an update on on that. Okay, thank you, Lindsay. Anyone like to come in on that just now? I don't know where Des is. Chair, Chair um, Tony's hand is up. Tony McDade's right, hand sorry, is up. I'm, I'm not seeing anybody here very clearly. I've got Tony and then I've got Anne. Okay, sorry. Possibly I will hand it to Anne as well because Anne's obviously heavily involved in that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thank Tony. you. Thank you. Des mentioned earlier, obviously, because of the circumstances last year, there was an underspend um, in relation to counselling through schools. But what we're seeing right now is an increase in the uptake of counselling through schools. We spent much of last year um, going through a procurement process for counselling providers because we wanted to be clear that the, the providers that we engaged with would offer high quality counselling to our children and young people. So that took some time and we worked in partnership with the procurement service to do that. What I would say is that now we are pleased with the range of providers that we've got. We know that some secondary schools um, are more engaged with the service than others but I think that's just a case of you know um, of time really um, but we know that counsellors are providing services for a, a wide range of reasons and also it's age 10 and up so we're looking we're monitoring closely the uptake in the primary schools as well um, we have had a meeting with our colleagues in budget to allocate to, to evolve funds to our schools so that they can then plan um, for the use of the, of the counselling services that they've got. Um, so I would say that this year we're definitely seeing an increase in uptake and I think that's going to continue as the, as the year goes on. So it's a positive picture. Thank, thanks, Chair. Can I um, just wondering if it was it would be possible to get a fuller update to a, a committee um, going forward, if that that was possible, a paper on it. Um, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah, if Tony's happy, yeah, absolutely, we can do that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you both. Thank you, everyone. If there's no further comments or questions, happy to accept this paper. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Right, we're moving on. So I'm sure a few of the, the same themes will come through here as well. We're on to agenda item nine, which is supporting learning, recovery and renewal. And Stuart's going to take us through this. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to bring this report today. And, and as Des has teed up, this follows on, um, I, I guess, from the previous report. But we see this very much as a team, as a, a positive step, not just 
in recovering some of the ground lost through COVID, but in starting in earnest the process of renewal and reshaping in response to the issues we faced and, and indeed to the, the learning we've all had to do systemically, I guess, as a result. Um, and it does potentially start to answer some of the questions. Uh, it's been really interesting to listen to uh, in terms of the, the, the previous item. So the purpose of this report is to provide an outline of the proposals to support learning recovery, ensuring that our children and young people continue to be provided with learning pathways, which will enable them to progress, to develop their skills and indeed to enhance their well-being through interaction with peers. Section three of the paper sets out an overview of the disruption that schools, school staff, children and young people and their families have faced since March 2020. Um, difficulties and issues we're all very familiar with and it notes, perhaps unsurprisingly, the negative impact that that has had. Section four um, recognises too that research indicates not only that there's been an overall impact on the progress of young people, um, but there has been a disproportionate impact on those who were already disadvantaged and while the resilience of young people and the support that they've had is recognised from a general perspective um, and commended indeed from a general perspective, it is noted that some will also require further targeted support as well. Section five of the paper goes on to note the improvement priorities that education resources has agreed with and for our schools for next session, well-being, continuity of learning and equity. And five two sets out the, uh, the intent to introduce further universal and targeted supports which are consistent with those priority areas and with the objectives listed in para 5.3. The aim is to provide a, a package of additional support activity which is coherent and which is consistent with what's happening in schools already, rather than introducing a, a range of ad hoc programmes or activities not necessarily aligned to the work that's already underway. Um, and I have to say we would commend the, the work of everybody working in our schools and settings in terms of the progress that's previously made, been made and the commitment to uh, moving forward in a positive way. Section six of the paper sets out the financial context. So we see the core education budget of around 350 million pounds, additional attainment challenge funding of 1.96 million pounds in SAC and 10.9 million pounds in PEF. Of course, the additional 2.24 million pounds allocated by the Council to Education in support of the recovery agenda and £13.4 million pounds from Scottish Government. Uh, I note that much of the, the Scottish Government allocation is allocated to specific purposes, as noted in 6.3. The additional allocation from the, the Council, from South Lanarkshire Council, affords us some welcome flexibility and that supports activity relating in particular to care experience young people, for example. And as a resource, we would thank elected members for the opportunity to do that a bit more. Section seven notes that the plans and activities we will progress were developed based on the views of school leaders, of school staff, of our learners and parents, and also by looking outward in terms of external partnerships and work that's happening elsewhere across Scotland. As a result, as stated in section eight, our approach will provide a range of opportunities, but will prioritise some groups and some stages indeed. The biggest element of the plan, which is noted in section nine, will be the recruitment and deployment of additional staff. Some 200 or so FTE teachers and 40 FTE support staff sitting beyond our, our current core staffing and any existing staffing employed additionally through PEF and SAC. Within that additionality, schools will appoint a, a recovery champion uh, with the remit of ensuring a prioritised focus on learning, teaching and assessment and with the aim of improving attainment. Para 9.5 gives a flavour of the types of activity that will be supported in Paras 9.6 and 9.7 note that linking with the resource plan and with each school's uh, own individual plan provides a mechanism for monitoring and for reporting on progress as well. Section 10 of the paper identifies a range of other programmes and activities to support learners uh, and further detail on those programmes is list, uh, that are listed in Para 10.3 are provided in Appendix 1. The South Lanarkshire Council tutoring programme has been made possible by council funding and that will provide access to support for care experienced and disadvantaged children in a form that's normally only accessible to families who can afford to pay for it privately. The Scottish Mentoring and Leadership Programme that extends the reach of the work done initially through MCR Pathways to provide individual support to those who will benefit from it most. Um, and we can also note that the graduate uh, work experience pilot 
that targets again supported those who might have left school uh, at the end of this session, but where the, the opportunities to, to do so into positive destinations have been limited, and I'll come on to that potentially in the next paper. Section 11 of the paper notes next steps. Um, this is still a work in progress, and we'd acknowledge that there's still much work to be done, uh, and education resources will provide further updates next session. Section 12 goes on to provide detail of the additional temporary posts, and section 13 shows how that funding or that additional funding is broken down, noting in para 13.3 that there is still just under a million pounds or so to be allocated. Chair, I refer committee to section two of the report and ask that a committee approves the recommendations that the proposals to support learning recovery, including the temporary recruitment of an additional 204.6 full-time equivalent teachers and 39.2 full-time equivalent school support assistance for session 2021-22 be noted, and that a further update is provided to Education Resources Committee early in school session 2021-22. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Stuart, for that update. It's obviously a significant amount of investment going from national level and then through our own budget as well in this area at the moment. So it's good to get an overview today. Um, and see we've got a few questions just now and I'm, I'm sure we'll drill down into some more of the detail. Uh, thanks for presenting that to us just now. Um, start off with Councillor Nalen, please, Lynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased and relieved to see the contents of this report. Um, it's a positive pathway for addressing the negative issues caused by COVID. Um, the report mentions prioritising transition stage pupils, disadvantaged and care experienced young people. Can assurance also be given that extra assistance for or tutoring will also be made available for other pupils who are behind or struggling due to non-COVID related illness and other issues? I think the aim is to, you know, operate on that needs basis. So you're right. So whether it's COVID or whether it's other issues which may or may not have been um, affected by or exacerbated by COVID, then we'll be looking to do that. I think the the aim here is to target the young people who need it most, irrespective of, of, of what's gone before. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Lindsay, please. Thanks, Hamilton. Thanks, Chair. Um, obviously, this is, um, the investment into your schools and into the teachers is very um, welcome and um, I see the money um, from government is obviously um, only for this year. I'm wondering what will happen to, in the posts are temporary, what will happen to the 200 odd teachers in support assistance that we are employing? Um, will, are you presuming that you'll absorb some of them due to retirement or um, by this time next year will we be seeing 200 teachers walk out the door? Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. I think Tony, were you once to come in on that as well? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Councillor Loudon. And you're quite right. Um, Councillor Hamilton, we would only be able to appoint people permanently. We would. We do have movement. We do have that kind of turnover around retirees, etc. We also um, have to take into other um, aspects of how the, the service is moving forward around some changes that we have as well. But we would only be able to appoint people on the basis of the full-time jobs that we have available. We would want to try and take as many people, but but core funding is not just an issue for us at a local level in South Lanarkshire. That's a national um, issue around around the, the funding models. So therefore, this is this is for us. We believe it's a good model for our for many of our staff. It's, it gives them security for, for that year, um, but we won't have 200 jobs at the end of this. I, I would suspect unless there's something changes around the national funding model. Thanks, Tony. Um, Julia, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to see this this report come forward. There's a lot of uh, huge positivity um, and uh, I, I'm pleased to see the, the targeted approach for, for young people that, that need a wee bit of additional help. Um, I'm interested to know the the detail for for how you would define um, whether a young person is is disadvantaged or whether there'll be a flexibility with that because I'm very aware that that while cost is definitely an issue if parents are seeking a tutor for for their child um, that's not the only um, issue that they might might need they're, they're just having a access to a tutor at all whether you can pay for it or not or or getting your child to that at a time that's um, that that you can then also can can um, offer a disadvantage. So 
I'm 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 keen to know that the 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 word disadvantage will be wide in scope and and will capture people maybe that that will have have um, additional challenges besides just cost. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to come back in. It, it, you're absolutely right, and I, I think the underlying principle in, in much of what we do is we set down a, a range of parameters, principles, and, and anticipated or expected outcomes. But we also work uh, on the basis that we we trust that our schools know their young people, uh, know the families, and know the individual circumstances. So there is always um, flexibility in there uh, to, to to allow for individual circumstances to be taken into consideration. You know, it, it is about getting that balance between uh, the, the focusing and the targeted support, but having, a, a, if you like, that pragmatic approach to, to recognising where somebody might not strictly fit a set of criteria in terms of SIND or postcode or uh, any of the other uh, indicators of poverty, but where common sense and knowledge and local knowledge um, will, would allow you to make a, a good decision and to the benefit of that young person or indeed to the family. Thank you, Stuart. I've got Joe, please, Councillor Fagan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I realise there's actually been a, a briefing note circulated just ahead of this meeting, which um, I've only had time to scan before the uh, meeting started. But what I was um, going to come back to was that um, the, the points about transitions. Um, I have had quite a bit of email traffic and I expect I'm not the only one, um, mainly from parents of P7 leavers um, who are anxious about the transition to high school. Um, now, some of that has related to public health messaging, I suppose, that isn't really within the council's control. So, you, you, you know, the, the, for several days now, you, you know, I've, I've had inquiries about, well, the, why can't the P7 uh, leavers assembly go ahead, but, I, but crowds are, um, you, you know, re returning to European football, for example. Now, I understand there are there are reasons and there are reasons set out in that in that briefing note, but I think it actually for me it was speaking to a wider anxiety that I'm sensing a lot of parents have about that P7 transition to high school. Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to e expand a bit more on what uh, these transition events are actually going to be like because it's not going to be two or three days learning at a high school. Um, and I mean, even normal high school learning isn't what 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 it what it is in, in in normal times. So I'm just wondering if you could expand a bit more on what that is actually likely to be, what these visits are likely to be. Um, I'm also wondering um, if there is in this if there is any scope because we're at the the, the summer period. Um, it wouldn't be possible, and we wouldn't have the resources, um, and, it, and, it, and it wouldn't be possible to to to, um, to to do anything particularly intensive. But I was wondering if there was maybe scope with empty buildings over the summer period. Is is that something that something a bit less formal could maybe be able to um, take place over? It may be too late to arrange such a thing, but I wonder if that that was a an option given the main concern and I think the main limiting factor here is all about the numbers and the people that are actually in school buildings and um, so I, I was really just looking for a bit more information about about transitions but specifically how we're kind of addressing the anxieties that the parents have about what well, is that quite a critical time in their you know in their children's lives. Thank you, Joe. Um, I'm going to, before I bring Tony in, um, I think I'll bring Councillor Allison in if it's, it's on the, the same issue, which I, I think it probably is. Um, before I do that, very quickly, um, I would like to say um, to anyone who happens to be watching this or has been in the same position, this is exactly the position I was in as a, a parent last year. My son left, S, uh, left Primary 7 and went into S1 um, through you know, a period which was extremely difficult and restricted in terms of what schools were able to do. Um, I, we ended up having a, a sort of transition uh, celebration event outside, actually, with a limited number of people. So I do understand how incredibly difficult this can be and how anxious it makes people. But I would like to say that in all of what we experienced, 
and all of that I've seen, um, which schools have been doing, both primary and high schools, have been um, events that they've been putting on and support that they've been offering to families. I think we should commend all of that work which has been going on because it, it has been tremendous. And speaking again from a personal, from a parent's point of view, the support that was offered to us as he started high school was fantastic, even though it was necessarily limited by the circumstances and the circumstances being the national restrictions, um, which are in place. Um, I'll bring in Alex just now because I think it was on the same issue and then I'll bring in Tony to respond to both. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, like Joe said, uh, we have been contacted, some of us have been contacted regarding particularly the end of term, if you like, celebrations, which are part of the paper we're on, promoting family and community involvement, etc. What I think I would like to hear more about is what the flexibility the schools have. Is it up to the head teacher? Can parent councils do anything? Because we are still under a great number of restrictions um, imposed at gover governmental level. That's not a criticism, it's just a realisation of where we are. But I think it is very good and would be helpful if we could uh, give indications as to what is possible rather than what isn't to give uh, the primary sevens every opportunity they have in being able to celebrate their successful seven years in primary school. Apologies, I'm on mute. Um, thanks, Alec. Tony, would you like to come in just now on both of those thanks? Yeah, thanks. Councillor Lowen, and actually, and, and important questions that, that none of us underestimate the significance of as well, just given the importance of, of transitions, probably that the context of that does continue to be the public health measures. And hopefully you'll see from the paper, the transitions paper that we put out um, this morning, and, and th th there are opportunities, and I would separate them out, the transition event events for young people moving from P7 into S1, that's a, a transition around their learning and their socialisation. The, the reality is that you're not going to get two days. That That's not because effectively you're adding in a seventh year group into the school. There's timetabling situations and around public health activity. But what we have said is that if possible, schools can have a tour of the building for young people. We've said it can be a, an hour and a half a, a tour. I know a couple of schools have put out that, actually more than a couple of schools have put out information to say that they would do it. Very practical implications for us. We can't have uh, different primary schools coming together. So if you, again, if you think of the size of some of our, our schools that have maybe eight or nine primary schools in an associated primary school situation, they can only bring one group in at one particular point in time, just around keeping them in a bubble scenario. And just to remember why we're doing this, that those bubbles we have dealt with over this weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday and Monday, we've dealt with public health specialists around self-isolation, around identification of positive cases. That still continues for us on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so it's about trying to find a balance. We definitely want young people where there's a possibility that they can do a transition. I spoke to a group of primary sevens. I was in a, um, a, a primary, primary school with this very question in mind. I spoke to some primary sevens. They were very keen. They were doing ongoing transition events. They've been doing them both virtually and indeed sometimes now the, the S the secondary teacher has been in the schools with them as well. So that act transition activity has been happening. There's been a significant level of engagement, whether that be virtual tours or whether that be very practical tasks and challenges that have been set. Then we will have physical visits for those young people if necessary as well. And Councillor Loudon made a, a, a very good point. We had to do some of this last year. If you remember, we were in lockdown last year as well. And those P7s into S1, this is a fixed point in their time. Those S1s settled very well, and I know that there's some anxiety around families, but I, I would distinguish that those those P7s have been, there's been genuine ongoing contact with the schools. There's been genuine ongoing delivery and trying to get to know them, and there can be some degree of a physical visit. If I move to excursions and activities and marking of those events, and again, we do say you can have them. We try to put a practical set of circumstances. It can be a local event if you're wanting to take them to a, um, a, a local park or somewhere for a, for a group of P7s. What we are seeing at the moment, and this is where I understand parents may, may disagree in some instances with this, we're seeing that parents can't come into the school grounds for this 
And the reason for that is, is about congregation, is around the government guidance that we, that we work to as well. doesn't mean that young people have not looked at, um, that schools have not looked at some virtual aspect of that. The young people will have still those events. I, I do know that young people will, schools will mark this special change. That will be also from nursery into primary, from primary into secondary as well. And indeed, I, I would probably hold out a special mention to our S6s that are leaving us as well, who've, who've you know, on the whole, had a tremendous school experience, I hope, and, and we're marking a really significant point in their life as well. It, it really is to to reassure people that we, we will work with schools. There is local flexibility, depending on what, what they do. But again, in all of these circumstances, we do need to put the parameters in place. We do need to think not about the just around the children and the young people themselves. We have a, a, a responsibility around the, the health of our staff in these situations by bringing lots of people on on site and about trying to make sure that we manage and mitigate those circumstances. Um, and the, the final point I would say is that schools and, and nurseries have worked really hard in this environment to try to make sure that that's as special as it can be. But we have a, a series of parameters within that. Thank you very much, Tony, for that oh, detail. Oh. Supplementary, Katie. Yeah, sure. Thank, you thanks, Tony. As you said, you've said a lot there, but the specific points I was asking around about what flexibility do schools have? Is it entirely in the head teacher's hands? What of of what the government re regulations are? Have we put any on top of that? Um, and I apologise if this is in the briefing. It came in this morning. I have not had an opportunity to read it in detail. Um, but I think it would be helpful to understand, because it's vastly different to what's happening up in Campus Lang Rutherglen with Katie compared to ourselves out in Clydesdale. Um, and it's what flexibility there are for the different schools to be able to take a different line. They, they, they can, Councillor Larson, but it's not exclusively for them. I don't think that that's, I think if, if you're going to, at that point, that's what our leadership responsibility is, is around supporting our schools and, and our nursery establishments. Schools do know their local community, but the, the, the point I was trying to make, there are parameters within that. So, for example, and I will, you know, deal with that one, there isn't scope to bring parents into the into the playground environments and the school buildings as we stand. That's consistent across a number of council areas. That may that may be one of the issues that I understand parents may be, may be saying, well, wait a wee minute. But we, we, we have set that out. However, there's very much flexibility beyond that around the kinds of activities that you might undertake. The I know that um, we've used some outdoor providers coming into schools. We've gone to local parks. Have, have been have, uh, There's been some visits as well. I've seen lots of schools tweet that out around the special activities for those leavers as well. But to reassure you, schools do have latitude, but for us, we have a responsibility to support our schools and our school leaders and our, our staff and children and young people and communities. So that would become, that's what our responsibility is about setting that guidance. Thank you, Tony, and thank you to uh, Joe and Alec for raising that issue as well. Um, I've got Mary and then Julia, Councillor Donnelly. Thank you, Katie. Uh, it was 10.3 and I think 11.2. In my area, people are asking about the uh, lunch, the summer. Um, can you advise Tony where that would be able to be accessed for people so that I can you know, direct them to where they can get that information. Thank you. I'm not sure. Did you get all of that, Tony? It was, um, Sorry, was that for me at this end, maybe. I missed some of it. Sorry, it just broke up just at the point. I think it was maybe around the I, summer summer program, um, but I'm not quite sure. Can yes. That. Um, you, Lynn will hopefully be able to expand. Obviously, the next paper picks up some of the detail. All right. 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 Okay, well, well, try try again at the, the next paper, um, right. and hopefully we'll get a better <laughs> connection for you then. Yeah. Um, thank you. Julia, please. Councillor Mars. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just to, to highlight the excellent work 
within Clydesdale. Having a, a fairly large family, I have a P7 who's soon to be an S1 and I have an S6 who is soon to leave school. So so I've got a, a bird's eye view as a parent um, of the good work and also obviously hearing the, the briefings from, from, from council. I can absolutely vouch that that both schools involved um, in in my area are are working extremely hard, and and there is an element of sadness for parents that things are not exactly the same, and we don't have the large indoor events when everyone can get together. But but actually, my young people are 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 very settled and ve and and really resilient and looking forward to the future, and they are actually enjoying a lot of of events that are are planned outdoors and in different ways. And I'm not saying that's not tough for parents because it is, but very much from the young person's point of view, I think they're doing things a different way and the young people are directing a lot of that activity as well and, and uh, working a different way. So I can absolutely highlight the excellent work at uh, certainly Kirkfield Bank Primary and Lanark Grammar. Thank you, Julia. Thanks. Um, any more comments or questions? I'm happy to accept the report, everyone. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for all of your input there, everyone. OK, moving on. The next item for noting is item 10. This is on the Enhanced Summer Programme, um, which I'm sure will pick up on some of the, the issues we had just spoken about there. And Lynn is going to present this for us. Morning, Lynn. Morning, everybody. Um, so I'll take you through the reports really to provide an outline of plan provision to deliver the Scottish Government funded the Enhanced Summer Programme for 2021. In terms of background in Section 3, you'll see it says there that the Scottish Government had announced £20 million worth of funding to help improve the well-being of children, of young people and of their families over the summer period. Of the £15 million that was allocated to local authorities, SLC has received £882,000. And this complements our existing investment and holiday provision, including our summer clubs um, that we previously ran uh, pre-COVID, and support also through the free school meal replacement for those eligible for free school meals on the basis of low income. You'll see that at paragraph 3.3, there are some bullet points there which identify the targeted groups that the Scottish Government had um, determined should be the, the focus of our programme over the summer. And that includes areas such as children from low income households, um, children who've been shielding and therefore whose ability to engage may have been curtailed, children with ASN, care experienced and young carers, and also children in need of protection. There is more, there's a full list at uh, paragraph 3.3. Appendix 1 in the report actually it provides a really clear diagram from the Scottish Government that underpins the planning and the delivery process, which essentially is to meet the aim of helping restore the well-being of children and young people during summer 2021. And the focus of that delivery is on kind of four main points. It's about providing opportunities to reconnect with friends, to get back out there, to meet your peers, to be part of the wider community and the outdoors, as well as reconnecting with trusted adults. It was about providing opportunities for children and young people just to play, to be active and to enjoy themselves and have fun. It's about equity, to make sure that we are picking up on the targeted groups that have been identified and that everyone gets um, a fair opportunity to be involved. And it's also about engagement about making sure that the activities are exciting, they are engaging and they're varied so that it will capture the imagination of everyone out there with the more variety we have, the more uptake we will get. Also, it's got to be based on a kind of co-creation with children and young people that we are um, taking their opinions about what they would like to see, including parents about what they would like to see over the summer holidays, about building on what we've already done and learned, especially from the summer programmes that we've run previously, and also in partnership working with um, the voluntary sector. Uh, that takes us on to section four of the report, and it really describes the intent to expand upon the programme and to use this money to seek support from the third sector in order that we can build on what we have and enhance the programme and also gives information, for example, about how we can widen it out. And we intend this year to use um, our UC facilities to expand uh, activities for 12 to 17 year olds, which means that we'll be able to provide some activities over six days of the week rather than the five that we were doing previously. And that will include some evenings and weekends as well. I thought it might be useful just to give you a bit of an update out with the report. It's probably been only maybe three weeks since we received notification on the funding about how much we were actually getting. And a lot of work has been done, but there's still more to be done so that we are ready for the first Monday after school ends towards the end of June. 
to support the existing programme and hopefully to augment that, we have widened out our canvas, canvassing of um, expressions of interest from school support systems, from active schools, from facilities. Um, we're also thinking about family cooking sessions, whether we can make them work. Transport, we've been engaging with Fleet to see if we can have some services, particularly in the rural area, to try and support access. And we've also had some meetings with um, the larger third sector partners that we used previously when we ran our own summer programmes, Mac and Trust, Hippie, Healthy Valleys, etc. And there is a list in Appendix 2, I think, of the report, 3 of the report, which shows you the larger voluntary organisations that we've been working with. So between the two of us, um, we are hoping that that extra input will allow us to increase the number of um, hubs or programmes that are run from our primary schools by at least two or maybe possibly possibly three. Um, to go wider than that, we are using Regen FX to assist with the admin and the comms in linking in with the other third sector organisations who may be interested in running programmes and to ask them to submit a bid. So our intention is that we would set up four panels over the geographical uh, locations and they would be made up of a broad representation of someone from education resources, from YFCL, from VASLAN, who've been heavily involved in our thought processes and our planning so far, from uh, South Lancashire Leisure and Culture and from local reps trying to ensure that we capture the voice of children, of young people and of parents. Uh, the closing date we have set is the 7th of June and we hope to inform uh, all of these voluntary sector groups by Friday, that would be the 11th of June. So Appendix 2, I think, of the report uh, gives some examples of some of the wide range of activities that we expect will be running out there over the, over the summer. Hopefully it will be something for everyone and that there are various sessions that will be running at various times of the year, but so at various times of the day and over the entire summer period. And that will end the Friday before schools go back the following week. We hope to provide fun, engaging and, you know, a wide variety of activities. And maybe a couple of things to point out. We may change location in some of the primary schools. We're trying to ensure that we have as broad a selection as possible, but that things are not too um, localised and that we are spread out enough. And we're trying to make sure that we have a widespread of range of activities and that we haven't duplicated too much between activities that might run with South Lancashire Leisure, with the third sector and with ourselves as well. So partnership working and communication will continue on. Um, right across the summer to make sure that that happens. In terms of targeting, obviously, it, paragraph 3.3 um, of the report, as I said, has bullet points of families and children that we seek to target. We will be using our information that YFCL hold. We've linked in with a good number of families during the pandemic and offered support. So we know there are people out there who would be keen. Head teachers have an idea of families who would benefit from that. And the voluntary sector also know who their families are as well. So we'll look to go as wide as we can in the communication of inviting people to participate. I think that's the main things. Um, maybe just to refer you back, I'm happy to take questions, but to refer you back to the recommendations really to note that planning and preparation for 2021 enhanced programme is underway, that we will be involving the third sector and um, we will feed back to you um, over the next few weeks to hopefully give you some more information that will confirm in more detail where activities will be running and what sort of activities will be running and over what time period during the summer holiday period. And we'll keep you engaged with that as we go and share the next stage of communication with our um, community. OK, um, happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Okay. Thank you very much, Lynn. Thanks for going through that. Just like to say that what an incredible amount of work has been done in a short space of time um, after you know the, this funding, extra funding from the, the government had been announced. It really is quite something to see the, the list of activities um, that are planned and the, the number of partners that will be involved um, this year. So thank you very much for going through that. And we'll look forward to get more information um, out to all of us in the next few weeks as well. I've got Councillor Donnelly wanting to ask something, Mary. I'm obviously having problems with my internet, so I do apologise first. Uh, I do, Lynn, fantastic programme that's coming on stream. My point was in the other paper was how would people be able to ac access that information and to have we communicated with the third sector, like local groups and communities. I've taken quite a few in Hill. Uh, in Ernock, so would they have been approached 
or do they need to make an application once they know this is up and running? The um, the communication went out through Region FX, it went out through Baslan and it went out through the council. So they should know it's there and they will be invited. There's an online application form, um, so it's open to anyone. We have also had some uh, parent councils and some parent groups have come yeah. forward asking if they would be eligible, which, of course, if they have an idea and it fits the criteria, you know, they're also eligible to apply. So um, right, well. should communication should be out there. And Ro, as I was speaking to Ros Gallagher, um, yesterday and she's intending doing another reminder communication this week as well. Okay, okay. thanks for that one. Thanks Lynn, thanks Mary. Any further comments or questions on this? No, happy to accept the report. Agreed. No. Julia, I think you'd just... I, I, I don't mind if you don't take me actually, I wasn't quick <laughs> enough getting my hand up. <laughs> on you go, I'm feeling generous. Oh, thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I was just going to, it is an excellent programme that, that I, I know through my, my engagement with the with Regen FX and the Youth Family Community Learning Service, eh, how much work has gone into this and there's still a load more to do um, and I have every confidence it will be absolutely amazing. Um, I think something that, that is really important and, and was a, a really strong theme from, from last year's engagement with young people in terms of um, emergency childcare and the the summer clubs that that uh, that ran was su the positive engagement that that young people felt in terms of the continuity of an educational experience going back to school really ready to learn and picking up from actually a, a, you know a a, a, um, a higher place of achievement than they than they had maybe started uh, from before the summer so I think because there's such a, a strong CLD. Um, it seems through this, I think it's something that maybe when um, further monitoring and measuring is is looked at, maybe that could be part part of that. Um, because I think it, it showed really th uh, strongly anecdotally <clears throat> last year, and it'd be really really useful to see how that ties into our renewal strategy towards um, uh, young people that maybe uh, need that wee bit help to to catch up. Okay. No, I'll, t I'll take that on board that we do do a kind of debrief at the end and gather information from surveys, etc., about how, what people felt about it just so we can learn. So I'll, I'll build that into the process. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, if that's us now, no more comments or questions. We've accepted the report. We'll move on to item 11, um, which is school leaver initial destination results 2019-2020. And Stuart's going to take us through this. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you again, Chair. The purpose of this report is to provide an update on the 2019-2020 School Leaver Initial Destination Survey results, which are produced by Skills Development Scotland and on the Youth Employability Service efforts to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on our young people. Section 3 reminds us that this is a, a regular report which is based on data collected uh, and provided nationally by Skills Development Scotland and notes too that it relates to young people who left school between September 2019 and September 2020. Para 3.4 and Para 3.5 note a range of partners who work together to provide supports as needed for young people at risk of not achieving a positive de destination. And Pana 3.7 shows the number of young people supported through the various employability activities. Uh, and those are the very pupils uh, supported by the teams who were the subject of the earlier paper on youth employability. Sections 4 and 5 note that a total of 3,174 young people left uh, during the period in question and that 94.8% of those young people achieved positive destinations. Now, that is down by 0 0.9 of a percentage point from 95.7% last year. While that's not what we want to see, I would note that the national figure fell by 1.7 percentage points from 95 to 93.3%. Um, this is the sixth consecutive year that we've met our target of being better uh, being beyond the national average. And this year we were joint fifth out of the 32 local authorities, which is an improvement on the 10th place last year. The table in 5.1 shows the numbers by area, eh, with last year as a comparison, and those are largely very positive. Um, however, I do note the, the drop in the Hamilton, Blanter, Urlingston area does stand out there, and um, th there's no obvious single factor behind that, although it may be around the disproportionate impact of COVID in some of those areas. What I would say is that the Youth Employability team are already engaging with those schools to follow up on last year and to prepare for the current group. 
the table in 5.2 provides a bit more detail in respect of the destinations in comparison with the national picture. Uh, I remind committee that the unemployed not seeking, seeking category is included in negative destinations, but it actually relates to young people who are unable to access a positive destination for any reason. So, for example, through disability or through a uh, prolonged illness. Section six looks more closely at the impact of deprivation, and we know that we've gone from being ahead of the national average to being in line with it uh, in, in terms of young people from backgrounds of deprivation. Now, this is an area of focus, and indeed the, the recovery plan, as I referred to earlier, includes a, a graduate related work experience programme um, specifically targeting this area. Section seven looks at care experience young people, and while the positive destination rate remains above the national average, there was a bit of a drop this year. Um, there were around 40 care experience leavers, so that drop represents a difference of two or three young people. And I suppose it's worth no noting that whether we look at sections five, six or seven, that any of the young people who have not yet achieved a positive destination remain very much on the books, so to speak, and they continue to be supported through the Youth Employability Team and by Skills Development Scotland. They're absolutely not lost to the system. I think it's important that we recognise that we continue and maintain contact uh, beyond the, 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 the school leaving uh, time. Section 8 explains how the service had to adapt to the challenges posed by the COVID pandemic and notes that despite those challenges, uh, as shown in Part 8 4, they continue to provide support for over 1,500 young people. However, it does look like the current situation will have an effect uh, on the opportunities available to young people in the immediate future. And in, res uh, in response to that, there will be a, a number of further targeted activities, including the ex care experience employability pilot, which is mentioned in Part 8.7. Section 9 provides a, an overview of next steps. What sits behind uh, those words, I guess, is the underlying message that the youth employability team are a, a dogged and a determined bunch. And despite the challenges that they face and that our young people face, they will continue to pursue positive outcomes for our most vulnerable young people. Uh, and with that, Chair, I'd invite the committee to refer to section 2 of the paper and ask for approval of the recommendations that the school leaver initial destination survey results as reported be noted and that the Youth Employability Service response to the challenges presented by COVID-19 also be noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Stuart. Any comments or questions on this? Nope, not just now. Okay, I'd just like to echo your comments about the right. dog, doggedness um, of the, the Youth Employability Team during what has been a, an extremely difficult time. Doggedness, I can't remember what the, the second adjective was, but I agreed with it at the time. <laughs> Thank you. I've got Councillor Allison looking to ask a question. No, it's really just to make a comment. Having been negative earlier, I think it's important also to be positive. Uh, and this is a very good report yet again regarding the destinations. If I could perhaps ask for one thing, in the past we've had the breakdown to individual schools, individual high schools, is it possible to get that again please? Particularly keen because I believe the last two reports showed my own ward high school with a 100% destination, curious as to whether that has been kept. Okay, thank you councillor, I'm sure we'll be able to get, um, get that information for you, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, happy to accept the report. Agreed. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, everyone. Moving on um, to Scottish Youth Parliament elections, um, which is item 12. And Anne is going to present this for us. Morning, Anne. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this paper is to provide an update on the process and timescales for the South Lanarkshire Scottish Youth Parliament elections. Section 3 gives the background to the paper and paragraph 3.1 describes how members of the South Lanarkshire Youth Council and Youth Family and Community Learning Service, in partnership with secondary schools and other established organisations, organise and deliver council-wide elections to democratically elect nine South Lanarkshire members of the Scottish Youth Parliament. Paragraph 3.2 describes how the Scottish Youth Parliament was set up to act as the voice of young people in Scotland and offers 14 to 25 year olds the opportunity to get involved in decision making processes in Scotland and the UK and it has 200 members elected from local youth forums, national youth organisations and from young people who have stood as individuals. 
Section 4 outlines the election process um, and I would ask members to note the information in paragraph 4.1 that the format for vo voting will be a paper ballot and is fully supported by the South Lanarkshire Election Office, replicating the same processes and using the same boxes and resources used in local and national elections. In the event of COVID restrictions, preparations are being made for the implementation of an online voting system as a backup plan, but we remain very optimistic about using the traditional method. Paragraph 4.2 details the process and in particular that candidate registration has been open since the 1st of April. Candidates are required to complete an online module to ensure that they're aware of what's required of the role that a range of approaches, including presentations in schools, school TV screens, notice boards, the use of social media and planned street work by the Youth Family and Community Learning Service and visits to groups where uh, restrictions permit, do take place to publicise the election and to stimulate interest. The deadline date for registration is the end of June, but this can be flexible and candidates are then supported to produce their manifestos to help with their campaign for election. As I've said, the voting process involves working in partnership with South Lanarkshire's election staff to arrange for ballot boxes and polling station resources to be loaned to set up approximately 50 polling stations uh, during October um, and up to 25,000 ballot papers are produced. The count will take place in East Kilbride Universal Connections and that's quite a traditional location and the Chief Executive will act as returning officer and I can confirm that the date and time of the announcement of the final results has been confirmed as Thursday the 25th of November at 4pm. Young people not directly involved in the election process are encouraged to volunteer to assist throughout the process and that then promotes obviously engagement in, in the democratic process and encourages those young people to cast votes as well. The newly elected MSYPs then attend training and workshops to equip them for their new roles throughout December and January. I would refer committee back to the recommendations at paragraph two and ask that the following recommendations are approved. That the arrangements to elect young people to be members of the Scottish Youth Parliament be noted that the commitment and contribution of South Lanarkshire Youth Council and Scottish Youth Parliament to the youth agenda be noted, and that the continued contribution and participation in local planning issues be noted. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Anne. I am Lindsay. Thanks, Chair. It's just to um, welcome the report and note the amount of work that the, the Council actually puts into to the elections. Um, I'm actually quite gutted to find out there's another election this year. Like I thought we were done until next year. So, <laughs> but it's amazing um, the work the MSYPs do. And in South Lanarkshire, we we have um, the the young people have elected a number of great MSYPs who have been on to do um, great things in politics and and in the wider in wider society as well. And it really is a great stepping stone for people. Um, and I really look forward to working with the, the new MSYPs that are elected in November as well. But thanks very much again to the Council for all the work that um, a number of departments put in. Thanks, Lindsay. Oh, sorry, I thought I was on mute there. Thank you. I don't know what you mean with not another election. I'm champing at the bit to go over to North Lanarkshire to help out in this by-election. We've got a loving election. <laughs> but seriously, I'd... I, we echo your comments, and thanks in particular to election staff as well, um, who have had a particularly um, challenging last few months, let's say, and I'm sure that all of us who were at counts are involved in any of that process know just how hard that they had worked to make sure things were safe and organised and happened um, as they should. Thank you. Um, if there's no further comments on this, are we happy to accept the paper? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Good luck to all the candidates who will be standing. Um, item 13 then, we have noti noti sorry, notification of contracts awarded, um, which you'll find, I was going to give you the page number, but I'm still scrolling, sorry, I'm working through a couple of windows here. And um, this is contracts awarded 1st of October last year to 31st of March this year, and Lynn is going to take us through this. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, just 
very quickly this report is for noting and as it says um, we're required by the council standing orders on contracts that we must report to education uh, resources committee to inform them of any contracts that have been awarded in excess of fifty thousand pounds so it's really just to say that this report covers contracts that have been awarded over the last six months from october to march and uh, Appendix 1 shows the list of contracts that have been awarded and they're all on the basis of lowest offer and or the most economically advantageous offer submitted. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, but the purpose of the report is really to provide notification that these contracts have now been awarded. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Um, Councillor Nealon, please, Lynn. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm sure there's a perfectly um, valid explanation, but... I just had a look down the list of contracts and the bottom one um, for passenger transport um, services framework is an eye-watering £24 million. How does that compare to last year and the previous year before then? Uh, and, and if it's substantially higher, what, why? Thank you. Um, Tony, your hands up there. Yeah, good, good question, Councillor Neil. Thank you. The, it's a framework, though, it opens up to £24 million. Pounds. It's not an allocation of £24 million pounds worth in terms of the contract, so it allows us a degree of flexibility. Remember, it's a needs basis, so so what we're doing is if there was anything beyond that, we would look into a procurement process again. So it allows, allows us that degree of flexibility of up to... Um, we do contract monitoring, and, of course, on the, in the monitoring papers, you will see that we provide an update around transport and the budget that, that relates to it. So we do have budget allocated to it as well. This is from the pr procurement side to make sure we've gone through the framework and the providers meet the, the specifications that we ask of them. So it's a threshold rather than it is a, an increase. But how, thank you. Um, but how does that um, compare to previous years? Just out of curiosity, because it does seem rather a lot. Um, um, I, I can check that for you, Councillor Neil, in terms of the framework itself. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions on this? No? Nope. OK. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, everybody. I don't have any other items of business today. Um, Councillor Nealon, you've still got your hands up. Is that just a legacy? Right. OK. Just to double check. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Don't have any other items of business. Um, this is obviously our last meeting before um, the end of the academic year. So I hope that um, if you have children or young people yourself or grandparents, or aunties or so on, that you get to spend um, a bit of time this summer enjoying their company. Thank you very much um, for all of your input today and all of your questions and take care. Thank you.